Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Gladness fills the world today. From the tomb that could not hold him, see the stone is rolled away. He is risen. He is risen indeed. It's not over. Think about the Easter story for just a moment. What happened that first Easter? There are a few women that got up early in the morning on Sunday. They had the spices that were essential to embalm a body with them, and they snuck through the streets just before dawn. They were afraid, they were confused, but they knew that their friend Jesus had died, and because he'd been taken off the cross just as the Sabbath was beginning, he hadn't been properly buried, and they wanted to go and give their friend a proper burial. And so they're sneaking through the streets, and I have no idea where they actually had to go, but it may have been that as they were making their way to the grave, they walked past Golgotha, the place of the skull, the place where a few days earlier they had stood in dismay and fear as they saw their friend Jesus hanging on a cross. For sins he never committed, he was an innocent man, and there he hung. And perhaps on their way to the tomb, they were able to catch a glimpse of that place, the empty cross, and they knew that Jesus was dead. And their last act of love was going to be to go to the grave and make sure he had a proper burial. And so they went past the empty cross, and as they were moving, suddenly uh, the fear gripped them as to how they would get past the Roman soldiers and who would take care of the stone that was rolled across the door, sealed by Rome itself, when the earth began to shake. And they weren't sure if it was actually shaking, but it seemed it was shaking. And as they got to the tomb, they saw that the stone had been rolled away. And as they came closer and looked in and saw the empty tomb, there were two men who greeted them. And these men looked at them and said, Why are you here? Why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen just like he said he would. Go and tell his disciples. And so the women left the empty tomb and hurried back into the city and they found the disciples and they told them and most of them were very confused but Peter and John said, we got to go check this thing out. And so they went running down to the, to the graveyard, to the cemetery and, and John kind of approached the grave cautiously but the Bible tells us that Peter went right in and when he got there he saw the empty grave clothes. The linen that had wrapped the body of Jesus when they had taken him down from the cross was there but it was empty. And the the cloth that had been wrapped around the head of Jesus was neatly folded and off to the side somewhere. And they believed, the Bible says. They believed. Suddenly the pieces were coming together, the empty cross, a reminder of the fact that Jesus had died for sins and sins could be forgiven. The empty grave to give hope that Jesus was alive. And the empty grave clothes to remind them that it was actually a physical resurrection. The body of Jesus was gone. And he was alive and he could be touched and he could be loved. And he could love them and they could actually have a relationship with him. The fact of the resurrection is what we hinge our entire Christian faith on. One of the best attested facts of history. And yet 20 years later... Paul had to write a letter to the church in Corinth because people were confused about those who were dying and what happened to them. And and so he writes to defend the resurrection. And I want to read just a few verses of what he writes about the resurrection out of 1 Corinthians 15. Follow along if you have your Bible, starting at verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 15. But if, if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Apparently there are people who are saying that. People who have died have just died and that's the end. He's going, how can that be if Christ has risen from the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching, has not, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified... For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all people. 
But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And then over to verse 50 where it says, So I declare to you, brothers and sisters, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does this perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For when the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Paul sort of raises two issues in this defense of the resurrection. The first is this. If Christ is not risen, then what? Well, there's a few facts that he gives. We won't talk about them long. We'll just mention them. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then Christ himself is nothing more than a liar or a lunatic. Christ said, I am the Son of God. I have come for a purpose. I'm going to lay down my life. And if this temple is destroyed, it will rise again in three days. He made the prediction. I am the resurrection and the life, he declared. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then he's a liar. Or he's deluded. He just thinks he's the son of God. If Christ had not risen from the dead, the disciples were completely deceived. After the crucifixion, they went and hid in fear and shame. But suddenly that fear and shame has turned to a joyful testimony. And along with the power of the Holy Spirit, they went everywhere proclaiming the good news that Jesus was alive. What changed? They had seen the empty tomb. They had encountered the risen Lord. And they had received his promise. If Christ is not alive, then the Christian church is a gigantic fraud. Without the resurrection, the church would be an amazing structure with no foundation. And by now it would have collapsed. If Christ has not risen from the dead, then the Christian experience is delusional. Our assurance of forgiveness, the joy of claiming that we're right with God, the peace we experience even in the most difficult circumstances, the fellowship we claim to have with God and with others would all be nothing more than a figment of our imagination. And the millions throughout history and from every nation of the world that have experienced the th- same thing we have would be, would be betrayed. If Jesus was not alive, there would be no life after death. Instead of departing to be with Christ, as the Bible says we do, our death would be no different than any animal. The hope and joy and peace that a dying Christian experiences would be nothing more than an illusion. And we would have no hope of ever seeing those who have gone before. It would all be a fantasy. In fact, Paul declares, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then Christians should be pitied more than anyone else in the world. We would be living in despair and darkness without hope. But, Paul declares, in fact... Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So what? What difference does that make? That's a question we wrestled with as we began to prepare for this Easter service. And we asked, okay, so what difference does that fact actually make in life? And so we started to think about people that we know where we've seen that their faith made a difference. And as we thought about that, our attention and our thoughts were drawn towards Dan and Bonnie Baskell. We've been praying for Dan and Bonnie. We've been praying for little Hannah, for their family for a long time now. So I went to Dan and Bonnie and I said, Hey guys, does, does the fact that Jesus rose from the dead mean anything to you as you're going through the challenges you're going through? And if it does, would you be willing to talk about it? And they said yes. So why don't you join me in welcoming Dan and Bonnie and Hannah and Tim as they come and join us on the stage this morning. Oh, and John's coming too. Cool. Should get a whole bunch more chairs here. I think those mics back there are going to work for you guys this time. Okay, we're good. Okay, you guys go stand behind. There's a mic for you, Bonnie, a mic for you, Dan. Let's make sure that your mom's mic is turned on. There we go. 
That's for you. Hi, Hannah. Hannah got high, high heels for the occasion. She's looking very pretty today. You guys are looking pretty handsome too, but not near as cute as her. <laughs> okay, this is just a part of the Baskell family. Bonnie, why don't you tell us about your whole family and how you got here and where you've been before you got here? Um, well, we, uh, before we moved here, we lived in Kelowna. And um, we uh, liked to camp. And Dan had had a vision of... Uh, of owning a campground. <laughs> now I'm not sure we have that. Well, we do have that vision. But anyway, of owning a campground and of developing it. And uh, we had camped up at Blind Bay, and he fell in love with the, the campground there. And um, that's what moved us um, here, is that we, we And what year was that? that? That was 2005. Okay, so about six years ago. Yeah. And we have six kids. We have another one here, too. That's Rebecca. She's here with her three little ones. We have six grandchildren. And she's here with her husband, too, Jonathan. <laughs> Lots of you know Jonathan Spooner. And then uh, John and Tim and Hannah. And two of our other ones couldn't be here yet this morning. And uh, God is good. So six kids, six grandkids. Yep. And a dream brought you to Salmon Arm. And a dream. The dream of developing that campground into a resort. Dan, how has that been for you? Uh, I mean, apart from the stuff with Hannah, we'll talk about Hannah in a minute, uh, but that's not been the only challenge you faced in life. Being a developer has been a challenge. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's, it's been all peachy keen. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure my wife, is the mic coming on? Testing one, two, three. There we go. Okay, we're I good. I hear us. When we came up here, yeah, I really did have a picture of what we were going to do. It was in my head, and we translated it to paper, and we're still following that process through. But I have to confess, I came up here with my picture or my agenda and uh, believing that we would accomplish these great things and make a pile of money in the process. I really did have an agenda. And God has changed that entirely. Um, I, it's, we don't have enough time to share a lot of that, but uh, we came into a development where it became less about us or me and more about the fact that we were evil, nasty developers making some kind of a change that the community wasn't prepared for. And we, we took it on the chin. Um, in fact, Bonnie equates it to walking into our wilderness where we left behind what was comfortable and, and safe for us and went into a brand new area that uh, was completely foreign. We had ideas of what it would look like, but it hasn't been anything like that whatsoever. So you came in as Christians with a real desire to honor the Lord and live with integrity and walk before your community, and that didn't work out. You weren't really appreciated by the community, were you? No, and probably, I shared this in our discussion earlier, probably the most disappointing aspect of it is that we felt fairly abandoned by even the Christians that were attending church and, and living in our community and, uh, and that was probably the most difficult thing because at no point did anyone from Blind Bay ever come to us and say, well, who are you guys? You know, what's really going on? Because there were things going on that were big and tumultuous and, and uh, we would say wrong, but regardless, that's, that's where that was. And yet nobody in the community really came to us with that. And that was, that was a difficult point. Now you're going to ask me, well, what's different here? Who does give us our support? Yeah. You guys. Um, God has raised up certain key individuals within our campground, um, those that have purchased into what we're doing, those that are working with us. Several of them are here this morning. Um, he's raised up campers that come back year after year and have loved our family and, and uh, supported us on, on, on a number of fronts. But then he's also placed us in this body of believers where we don't get much time to be here and serve with you and do the things that we used to do back in Kelowna. But there are many of you who have just undertaken to help carry our burden, even in the park. And then, of course, we know that so many of you pray for what we go through with our daughter, Hannah. All right, Bonnie, uh, Christmas 2008, things changed dramatically in your lives. Tell us about that and sort of the journey through to April of 2009. Um. In, at Christmas of 2008, Hannah started waking up, usually around 2 in the morning, um, and coming into our room saying, my heart hurts. And uh, we would, at first we just thought, oh, indigestion, too much sweets, you know, something. Um, but as it progressed, we would put our hand on her heart, and it would be going really fast, um, sometimes too fast to count. And um, 
so uh, that they, they progressed so that we were getting one a week, then it was two a week, and by, Christ, uh, by April of 2009, um, she was having up to five episodes a week where her, her heart was hurting and racing, and we'd had an incident at school where she, she didn't stop moving, but she could no longer walk and had had a, just kind of a little bit of a, a physical collapse. And um, we were going to the hospital in Vancouver for a regular checkup, um, she has a, a little bit of a, a problem in the formation of her palate and whatnot, so we were seeing speech and, and just regular people there. Yeah, we'll get there. And, um, and so when we were there, we said, um, she's complaining of chest pain. She's complaining of heart, and her heart's going really fast sometimes. And they said, well, we can do another echo. We did one when she was two, and her heart was fine, but we'll do another one just to be sure, and you guys are only in town for these two days, so we'll hurry up and just fit it in. And um, they did the echo, and they found out that she had um, extremely high pressures in her uh, right arterial part of her heart, and um, she was a stage four of primary pulmonary hypertension. And at that point, uh, they gave us very little time. They gave us a year to a year and a half, and they said, if she ever has an arrest, you won't get her back. And um, she, we, we said, well, we'll get a defibrillator. The, the school will help us with, with fundraising to get stuff. And they said, you, you, won't, you won't get her back. And, uh, yeah, God is good. And uh, how many of those episodes that she was only going to have one of, how many has she had? Hannah, how many, how many times have you... On his cardiac How arrest. You had a heart seizure? Um, 16. And who saved you? God. God. 16, you. and God has saved you. That's amazing. That's really something because uh, one was supposed to be all she could handle. So that's a real blessing and a real answer to prayer. Uh, last Sunday, we announced to the church that you're going to be up here sharing this week, and uh, your world kind of took a major twist in between then and now. Tell us a bit about what happened on the weekend. Well, last Sunday was Palm Sunday, and uh, it was a wonderful service here, and, and we were singing, and, and I was very convicted that when we were singing Hosanna, um, that the people back in Jesus' time were all excited about what God was going to do for them, and that this was the Messiah, and they could sing Hosanna, Hosanna, um, hail to the King, but when, when they didn't turn out the way they thought it should, they crucified him, and I was very convicted that I didn't want to be that kind of person, and, um, and Sunday night, Hannah had a significant cardiac arrest, and we hadn't had one for about three months, and it was a, a stark reminder to me that I needed to praise God regardless, and that no matter what had the plans he had for her, that God was good, and that I needed to trust him. Um, we stayed at home. Uh, we had a nurse for the nighttime, and we were leaving for Edmonton in the morning anyways, um, and we just felt like we just we did compressions uh, when she came back, her heart hurt, she was in terrible pain um, and uh, but she was rescued, and we just read some verses to her, and we went to sleep for the night, and we got up in the morning and we started our drive and about fifteen kilometers out of Jasper, she had another arrest, and uh, this time it wasn 't as easy to bring her back and um, she 's had She's had multiple arrests. But when you have an arrest, when you have two arrests in 24 hours, it's really difficult to get you back. And most of the time, they don't get you back. And so she's had twice, she's had them close together. And this time, it took us about eight minutes of doing CPR on the side of the road um, to get her back. And we had um, the first truck just drove by us as Dan's waving the oxygen tank. Nice and, man. <laughs> <laughs> and hoses and everything else and I'm doing compressions and I think he was a little freaked out but we did have some other people stop and and um, and they called and got on the CB and got officers and stuff there and and um, mm -hmm. and we got her back and again the hospital is just shocked they don't know what to do with it and we didn't just get her back just barely she's well she has no brain damage um, she she was cheerful and talking within a couple of hours, and God is good. So that's one of the reasons why we brought Hannah up here. We're not terribly comfortable talking you know, too much in her earshot, but 
She's learning more and more. What happens to her is very significant. And we wanted all of you to see you know, on, on, on Sunday morning Easter that our daughter is up here walking and maybe not bouncing and doing the things that other children do, but she's well. And this is a testimony to what God is doing in her life. It's not over, is it? It's not over. It's not over. God is in control. Um, do you guys want to go down? Sure, you go ahead. Find a comfortable spot to sit with the rest of the folks. Way to go, guys. These brothers have been real troopers, by the way. Uh, some of the other family are away from home, but these guys have been close to home and have been awesome. I'm sure you've appreciated. Uh, and they've gone through a lot with their little sister. That's been pretty, pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. This kind of stuff has got to have had an impact. You know, everything, the business deals, the financial thing, the community and the, the health. How has this impacted your family and your marriage? Well, she still loves me. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's had definitely an effect. I mean, Tim's seen things that we wish nobody would ever see, let alone what he's had to be a part of. Um, some of our other kids have missed the actual events, but they live with the reality of, of daily wondering what this day brings for Hannah. Um, that, that's been a tough component there, and I know that it's really stretched and challenged um, all of our children's faith. For Bonnie and I, um, certainly we're seeing God in a new way, but we process, the, process things differently, like far differently. I'm, I'm a guy. I, I kind of keep the emotions checked in and don't talk too much about some of these things, or I make a, a joke of it because I'm, I'm also one of those type of stupid people. But anyways, <laughs> and my wife, she handles things completely different, and, and that's created some tension, and uh, that's part of our walk right there is just learning how to walk through that. How about your faith in God? I mean, I, I know that you have a very strong faith, but have there been moments of doubt? Yep. Um, yeah, we've had to, we both, we've both wrestled with God. And um, at times we felt very abandoned by God. And at times I particularly have felt like, God, if you're going to take her, then you better take me because I'm not staying if she's not staying. And, um, and God works, God works and he, he brings us around and he uses people to encourage us and bring us meals or um, pray for us. We know, we know that we can do some of the things that we do because you guys are praying for us. Mm-hmm. And, um, and sometimes we feel like we just are grabbing God by the shirt and saying, you can't do this. Don't take me here. I can't do this anymore. And you don't understand. And I was hit this morning, the first service, and I didn't say it, but this second I wrote it down because that song, I am not skilled to understand what God has willed, what God has planned. And that just, I don't understand. I don't understand, but I want to, I want to accept and I want to submit and I, I want to believe and I want to know that God is good. And I, and I do. God is faithful. The scripture we're looking at this morning says, if Christ has not risen from the dead, then as Christians, we're actually a pretty pitiful lot. Because that's what we're we're hinging it all on, right? How has the fact that Jesus is alive, that that it's not over, how has that impacted the way you've handled all of this? I, I have to tell you, first of all, none of us are here by mistake this morning. We're here for a reason we could have been in Edmonton still. And and. Bonnie and I want to communicate that this isn't about us. All of you are going through things that are challenging in in your moments, and you're struggling with things that are big. And and I'm sure none of you want to be us, but you're carrying things that are also difficult. And and this whole message today is that it's not over. It's it's not over. And we want you to know that we're, we're seeing a bit of a bigger picture sometimes, sometimes maybe not, but we're seeing that that God has an agenda and a plan that's far different and bigger and better than ours. And, and sometimes we have to just walk the walk and trust that the outcome will be something that he can use, that will bring glory. And, and wherever you guys are at, where we are at, I mean, we struggle with this. We get angry. I have my mad-ons towards God, and he's, I'm learning he's big enough to carry that. He's big enough to carry whatever I have, and he's big enough to carry you. And a number of years ago, and I'm glad we don't have another service behind here, but a number, <laughs> a number of years ago, Bonnie and I prayed that our children would see God in a miraculous way because we had our religiosity. We were church attenders. We did this. We sat on boards. 
and it was our faith in part that our children have grown up in, and we wanted them to have their own faith, something that they wouldn't question. You know, it wouldn't be dads and moms, it would be their very own. And one day here in Blind Bay Resort, um, our oldest son, Josh, went out and had a terrible accident on a, on a tube, a flying tube. And in the church, some of you might remember that, yeah. we had come in one evening and we were en route from Salmon Arm Hospital down to Kelowna. Josh had broken ribs, he had burst out his lungs, his heart was, was enlarged, the periactontal sac whatever. or whatever. Paula would know she was there. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, it was, it was unbelievable. And, this, and we stood in this hospital over here with my son's lung flu, filled with fluid, and he, this was a sick man. He was, he was injured. By the time he got down to Kelowna, we had come here, and people were praying, and we were praying and pleading with God. And in, in about a 12-hour period, Josh was miraculously delivered from this stuff. No sign of broken ribs. Um, his lungs were closing. The fluid was draining. He got up out of ICU the very next morning against all odds. That was a very uh, momentous time in our walk. And, and, and I believe that that's, that that's what we wanted our children to see, was that this is something bigger than us. And now we have Hannah. And Hannah is, she has given us um, license to walk in areas that we never could have walked without her. You know, we go into the children's hospital, now we're in Edmonton, and it, it's like we walk into this hallowed ground where people are just grinding it out. We've watched children suffer things that shouldn't suffer. I mean, children shouldn't suffer like That's this. Right. But we've been able to walk in, and by this girl, we've been able to go and minister to people flat out, right now, on the spot. No scripture verses and Bible and, you know, standing from the front of a church or anything like that, but just meet them right where they're at because we identify. We're Mm. right there. In 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 a sense, we've gone from where we were through this wilderness period to to new opportunities to see God work. And this is about him. Right. And just for for how the resurrection has impacted that, it's that this is not it. And a, get a really strong eternal perspective and it changes our perspective because of what Christ has done and the hope of eternity huh, that makes everything possible because we have that hope yeah. we have that hope mm-hmm. when, when Dan and Bonnie and I were meeting to talk about this Bonnie shared a scripture which I'm just going to read to you and Bonnie just take just 30 seconds to uh, this is a scripture she's prayed over Hannah it's really been meaningful to her I'll read it. You tell us what's been significant about it. It's from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. It says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia at Blind Bay Resort in Edmonton, <laughs> along the roadside on your way to, to Edmonton. We don't want you to be uninformed about the hardships. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts we felt the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope, and he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. Bonnie, share about Um, that verse. That's just, uh, God gave me that verse, and I just... That was, that was our verse for us and for Hannah. And uh, some of the significant things there was we, we know she's been raised from the dead. She was gone. She was as gone as she can be, and that's not the first time. And secondly is that he did deliver them, he has delivered them, and he will continue to deliver them. Right and on. we can count on God to continue to meet us and to rescue us and, and to continue to be there with Hannah and it's through your prayers, and it's, it's through the prayers of many, and it's through you guys upholding us. Dan, Dan hinted at some of the things, that opportunities we've had, and you guys pray for the missionaries. You pray for people who are out there, and in some ways, when you're praying for us, it's no different, and not that we're, we're missionaries or doing anything, you know, far-reaching out there, but God uses these things to witness to other people, because... Um, the guy who stopped on the road has already contacted Dan and said, how, you know, how are things going? And I need to speak with you guys sometime and would love to come out. And the, the guys that were in the air ambulance with Dan said, how do you do this? You know, like, how do you walk this walk? And, and Dan just said, because this is not it. 
This is not it. We have heaven to look forward to. And he could share his whole testimony with that. One of the ladies at the hospital, um, we had gotten to know her really well in the fall. And she came down from Grand, um, Fort Mac the day that we were going to get discharged, but we were still up in the ice room. And, and she came, her son was having a biopsy. And it, he's five. His name's Jackson. You can pray for somebody else. You can pray for Jackson. And she knows about God, but I don't think that she knows God personally from all the talks we've had. And, and she came running up to the ice room, and she hugged us, and we cried, and she hugged Hannah. She wrote on her Facebook, Today I saw God. I saw God in the face of a six-year-old child who has had multiple heart attacks and could still smile at me. Today I saw God. I love you, Hannah Baskell. And I thought, that's it. That's it. When you get to see just a little bit of the bigger picture, then it's hard to say it's worth it. But it is worth it because this is not it. This is not it. This is only a little piece. This is only a little time, and heaven is it. Heaven is it. And so that scripture, may it be an encouragement to all of you to pray and to know that you're prayed for too when you're going through really difficult times. Right on. Well, we could talk a long time, but uh, we do need to wrap this up. Dan and Bonnie, thank you for sharing. Why don't you join me in thanking them? And Hannah. Thank you. Hopefully it'll encourage you to keep praying for the Baskals and uh, also to just be challenged in your own life as you're facing the challenges that you face. Like Dan said, their challenges are not your challenges. Your challenges are your challenges. And the same God that's adequate for them is adequate for you. Very quickly, Christ is risen. So what? Well, it makes sense to share the good news of the gospel. Because there is hope in the gospel. It makes sense to feed the hungry and clothe the naked and demonstrate the love of Christ. And tell them that there can be hope. Because there is hope. And if you can't go to God, where else can you go? Because Jesus is alive, our faith is built on a solid foundation. We don't have to go. Is it real? It's real. And if you're not trusting God, you have no hope. This is the only hope. And this is the solid foundation. Because Jesus is alive, our sins are forgiven. His death on the cross was something he didn't deserve, but his resurrection proved that the wrath of God was satisfied and our sins could be forgiven and we could have a right relationship with God. And because Jesus is alive, our hope goes beyond death. It's not over. Whatever you're facing in this life is not the end. There's a hope that is eternal. To live as Christ, to die as gain. And because Jesus has risen from the dead, we can experience peace and victory in any and in every circumstance. At the end of this passage, it talks about the sting of death. You know, the sting of death is the fact that after death we face judgment. But because Jesus took the judgment for us, he took the sting. So all we have to look forward to is the hope and the promise of eternal life. And the fact that God is in control. You might be here this morning and you maybe came to church because it's Easter and you decided to come with mom and dad to make them happy or grandpa or grandma or maybe you just showed up and God knows that you needed to be here this morning and if you have never trusted Christ as your savior you can experience the gift of eternal life. And if you are a Christian you are not to be pitied more than everyone else. In fact Christians should be envied more than anyone else in the world because we have the hope we have the assurance, and we have what it takes to face even the toughest times of life. No matter how challenging or difficult your life may become, you can have the assurance that you can live in the power that brought Jesus Christ from the dead. As the worship team comes back to the stage, I just want to read these last two verses to you again out of the message. But now in a single victorious stroke of life, all three, sin, guilt, and death are gone. The gift of our Master, Jesus Christ, Thank God. With all that's going for us, my dear, dear friends, stand your ground and don't hold back. Throw yourself fully into the work of the Master, confident that nothing you do for Him is a waste of time or effort. It's not over. Christ is risen, and He alone is our hope. Let's stand together and sing about that hope this morning.